I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and welcome you to worship on this fifth Sunday in Lent. It's good to be coming to you via video, although it's very unusual not to be surrounded by you, the members of the congregation, and Corey and Kay behind me. But it did seem good today in the midst of so much that is unfamiliar to do a few familiar things and see a few familiar places. It is good to be with you this morning for even though the sanctuary in which I'm speaking is empty, I'm not alone for you are with me and the Lord God we serve is with us and we're surrounded by the great cloud of witnesses, indeed the communion of the saints. And this morning we join our worship with theirs. It's a privilege to come to you this day as we begin to worship. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we give you thanks that on this day, even as many of us are at home practicing social isolation, social distancing, we are not alone for you are with us. You promise to be with us where two or three are gathered in your name. You promise to be with us by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. And so as we gather this day, whether we gather simply in spirit or with others, we give you thanks for your promise to be with us always. And pray now that you would open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we would hear with joy what it is you say to us this day. Amen. The gospel lesson for today comes from the gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. John writes, now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, and after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble, because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble, because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was merely referring to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. 
and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came and saw where Jesus was and saw him, <clears throat> she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he's been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me. But I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. This is for us the word of the Lord, for which we give thanks to God. Among the many things the coronavirus has given rise to is bad theology. Whereas most churches, including ours, have made the painful but well thought through decision to close their doors during the global pandemic caused by the novel coronavirus, one church, well, several really did not, but one in particular. One church in Louisiana, for instance, held a worship service attended by over 1,800 people using 26 buses to pick up people from across five different parishes around the Baton Rouge area to bring them in. The church's pastor, a man called Tony Spell says, the way to handle a pandemic is through the healing hand of Jesus. Pastor Spell bases this belief on a verse that he finds in the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Mark, where Jesus supposedly says, that is our command. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, if you've ever heard me preach, you know that I don't say very often Jesus supposedly said. For one thing, I believe that the Bible is the divinely inspired word of God, that it is therefore reliable and trustworthy in matters of faith and practice. For another, I put no stock in the work of the Jesus Seminar, a group of scholars who in the 1990s would gather to vote on the likelihood of the authenticity of various things of Jesus. He probably said this, he might have said it, or he probably didn't say it. But the reason I doubt the veracity of Pastor Spell's proof text is that I can approach the Bible critically 
which basically means that I don't have to take the Bible literally in order for it to be true or for it to have meaning. It also means that I've been given some tools for analyzing the scriptures, tools that I put at your disposal every week as I preach the sermon. And the tool of text criticism says that that part of Mark's gospel that Pastor Spell quotes is not reliable. In fact, it almost certainly was not part of the original Gospel of Mark. One big clue to this is the bad theology that you find in these verses. This is the part of Mark's Gospel where Jesus supposedly tells his disciples that they should pick up and handle venomous snakes, that they should drink poison, because if they do so, no harm will come to them. Now, the fact that Jesus nowhere else in the scripture says to do things like this might be our first clue that this is not a reliable passage and probably not the kind of claim on which you'd want to stake either your health or your life. But bad theology doesn't care about things like text criticism or criticism of any sort, really. Bad theology doesn't welcome the application of reason or logical thinking when it comes to interpreting scripture. Bad theology is usually content with things like, the Bible said it, or God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Which leads to not well thought out ideas like, Jesus is my co-pilot which should not be the case if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, because that means that Jesus should be in charge of your life, not helping you as you control your life. When Jesus is your co-pilot, you get things like 1,800 people coming into close contact with each other in the middle of a global pandemic. I'm ranting about bad theology because the story of Lazarus is rife with possibilities for some truly terrible stuff, starting with the shared complaint of the sisters Martha and Mary. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It looks like a statement of faith, doesn't it? Jesus, I believe you have power the power to prevent bad things from happening. But I think this really comes from a school of magical thinking and shares a lot in common with the theology that says that if you handle venomous snakes and drink poison, nothing bad is going to happen to you because God will protect you from harm. Yes, God does have the power to protect you from harm. God does have the power to prevent bad things from happening. God has the power to prevent you from getting hurt. But God also gives you and me the power to use our brain. Sometimes it's probably better just not to tempt fate. Jesus put it a slightly different way when the devil took him to the very highest place on the temple and tempted him to throw himself down from there because the Bible knew the promises of the scripture that God would send angels to protect Jesus so that Jesus wouldn't so much as stub his toe against a stone. The Bible does say that, Jesus said to the devil. The Bible also says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. If you had been here, suggests that having faith, believing in Jesus, being a Christian, is a kind of lucky charm, a talisman that we brandish in order to ward off evil the way garlic is meant to ward off vampires. But friends, I don't think that's what faith is about. We shouldn't believe in Jesus because we think that being a Christian will put a force field around us, meaning that we'll never get sick, we'll never get hurt, we'll never have to suffer loss or trial or death. Jesus doesn't promise us that. Jesus doesn't promise to give us superpowers or to make us invincible. Jesus doesn't promise that things won't get hard or that we won't get hurt or even that the people we love won't get sick or even die. In fact, Jesus is remarkably realistic about death in the midst of life. 
which may explain why Jesus doesn't rush off to Bethany when he gets word that Lazarus, his friend whom he loves, is sick. This illness does not lead to death, Jesus explains to his disciples when they express concern, disappointment, confusion that he doesn't seem concerned. Rather, this is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Only while Jesus tarried there two more days, Lazarus died. Life happens and death happens even when Jesus is the Lord of that life. Well, Lord, what about it? Mary and Martha want to know. We warned you. We gave you ample time. You knew that death was a possibility and you didn't come. If you had been here, our brother would not have died. Which gives rise to the possibility of more bad theology. One possibility is that God or Jesus simply doesn't have the power to do anything. This is the view of those who think that Jesus' power is primarily that of his moral authority, that Jesus' real ministry is that of an ethical teacher. It is also the view of many agnostics and atheists who look at the world replete as it is with disease and poverty and violence and suffering and wonder, where is this God of love of whom Christians speak? Surely if there is a God who loves us, this God would do something to prevent all this suffering. And often God's silence or God's delay doesn't help. In fact, it leads to the other bad theological possibility, which is that God simply doesn't care. On this view, it's not that God doesn't have the power to change things. It's simply the case that God crassly doesn't care, that God cruelly can't be bothered to intervene. The fact that this is not the case is shown by two of Jesus' reactions. First, it's anyone who's had to memorize Bible verses for a scripture competition knows because it is the shortest verse in all the Bible, Jesus wept. Jesus wept for Lazarus and for Martha and for Mary because his friend was dead. Someone Jesus loved had died and that death grieved him deeply. Jesus' tears are the public acknowledgement of the pain that death causes in human life. And so I like to think that Jesus cries with us when someone we love dies because Jesus cares. But if grief is an understandable emotion, Jesus' second reaction is much less understandable. Indeed, it's puzzling. For though he cried, when Jesus sees Mary crying and all the others around her crying, people who had come to console her and sharing in her grief, Jesus got angry. Our translation tries to tone that down a little bit, to soften it by saying that Jesus was greatly disturbed. Some translations want to say Jesus felt compassion for Mary. But usually that word means angry or indignant, which has led to all kinds of speculation about why Jesus would be angry. Maybe Jesus was angry that the power of death had been made evident to his friends in such a costly way. Maybe Jesus was angry because he realized that he too would soon face death. Maybe Jesus was angry because he felt that he was being pressured into doing something remarkable before it was the right time for him to do that, to reveal his glory. Or maybe he was angry that it seemed that Mary and her friends didn't really 
believe. That she and her friends didn't seem to believe that Jesus had the power to do anything about what had happened. If Jesus loved Lazarus so much, said many of the people who were there with Mary, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept Lazarus from dying? I think we often want Jesus to be a preventative measure, a prophylactic measure, a protective measure. We want Jesus to keep us safe from the world's sharp edges. We want Jesus to prevent us from getting hurt. If you're here, Jesus, as you say you are, then do something. Do something about COVID-19 and the resulting pain that so many people are experiencing, whether because they're sick or because they've been put out of work. Do something to turn around in the economic downturn. Do something to bring our life back to normal. Do you not have the power or do you just not care? Lord, if you had been here, brother would not have died. Bad theology stops there. But if you were paying careful attention, you might have noted that one person's theology does not stop there. Yes, it's true that Martha had said to Jesus that if he had been there, if he had come when he had been called, then Lazarus would not have died. But she hastens to add, but even now I know, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. As Constantine Campbell remarks, Martha does not know the end of the story as you and I do. She has no idea what Jesus is about to do, and she does not expect him to raise Lazarus from the dead. And yet she expresses hope even after death has occurred. It is as though she is saying, I don't know what you can do now, Jesus, but I know you can do something. That, I think, is faith. Maybe not yet mature, fully developed, beautifully articulated Trinitarian faith, of the sort that people like me want people like you to go around expressing. But believing both that Jesus cares and that Jesus has the power, Martha hopes that Jesus can do something. Well, says Jesus, what about raising your brother from the dead? Oh, Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. That was the belief of devout Jews of Jesus' day and time, believing in the final future resurrection at the end of time. And that's some comfort, but it's not the same as having Lazarus here. Martha... Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I, Jesus, am the resurrection and the life here, now. Resurrection isn't then just some hoped for, wish for, pray it will happen kind of pipe dream. Resurrection as Jesus' gift of life is both a future and a present reality. Resurrection is something that you and I can experience in the here and the now. For Martha and Mary, and not least Lazarus, resurrection looked a lot like a dead man brought back to life, restored to his family, given back to his friends, returned to normal life. I can't guarantee that resurrection will always take that form. Maybe with the exception of Jesus, it never does. But what is crucial is that Jesus has given Lazarus 
physical life again. Given Lazarus' physical life again as a sign of his power to grant eternal life here and now, and at the end to raise all the righteous dead to life. I am the resurrection and the life. It is that assurance that Jesus and his power to give life is present with us here and now, because Jesus is here now, Jesus cares, Jesus has the power, for Jesus is resurrection. That's not bad theology. I hope you will spend a moment to pray with me. Let us pray. God of compassion, source of life and health, strengthen and relieve your children who are ailing and give your power of healing to those who minister to their needs, that those from whom our prayers are offered may find help in weakness and have confidence in your loving care. Through him who healed the sick and is the physician of our souls, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I thank you for having spent this time with me. And my prayer for you this week, as you continue to be isolated in your homes, to practice appropriate social distancing, you will know that God cares, that Jesus is here, that the power of resurrection is with us always. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Go in peace.